Okay. Uh, for, for everybody who was in, uh, welcome. Nice to see you. And uh, happy um, yeah, public holiday to all of you. Happy Labor Day. And uh, yeah, welcome to do, uh, today's Leica conversation. Uh, today is the fifth Leica conversation that, that we are doing now. And um, <clears throat> I hope you already had the chance to visit some of our uh, earlier sessions. And of course, I hope you also enjoyed it. And uh, for, for those who are joining us um, the first time today, uh, within this series, the Leica conversation, uh, we always look into different topics from different photographers. So we always have a special guest I will uh, introduce in a couple of uh, seconds. And uh, we also having a look at, uh, at the special topic from these people. And um, yeah, during the session, um, feel free to ask questions. Use the, the chat box for that. Um, I will um, ask those questions from time to time. And in the end of the session, we also have, a, of course, enough time to, to answer all the questions. And um, yeah, so let me introduce our, our guest today, a very interesting person. You've maybe uh, seen him before, if, if you are from Singapore. So he's uh, um, from the US and he started his photography career in 2004 as a, as a photojournalist and he was also into uh, videography. And then in 2012, when he was in Singapore, uh, he, he switch, uh, switched his job description to a um, yeah, TV celebrity, I would say. So <laughs> he had, a, he had a, um, um, a show which was called Photo Face Off on History Channel from 2012 and 2000 uh, from 2012 and to, until 2017 but then he luckily for us today so we can see his nice pictures then he decided in 2017 uh, to go back and focus on the photography topic again and uh, his name is justin mott hello justin welcome hi thanks for having hi. me today and thank you everyone i see people from all over the region so it's great to see people from malaysia from singapore from borneo or Brunei, did I see some? Anyway, there are a lot of people from all over the place. So hello from Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much also for uh, to you to to join us today. Um, I think we have some uh, very interesting topics about. So today's description of the main topic, Kindred Guardians. Before we are going to have a look into um, your photo series, um, please give us a little bit of information about that whole project. So. Um, for those of you who don't know, we will, we will have today a look at different sections of that project. Um, but in general, what was the start of that project? How did you, how did you encounter this and how, why, why did you decide to do this? Yeah, Kindred Guardians for me is a, is, was a project that I decided to do to go back to my roots of photography, which are in documentary and in photojournalism. And I've always had this love and passion for, for animals. And, you know, for 10 years doing my TV show and doing, um, doing commercial photography, wedding photography, you know, assignments for the New York Times, I was always craving and missing a personal project, but I never had time to do it. I'm sort of one of those catch 22s where I worked too hard and got, got so much work, which was what I worked towards, but I wasn't able to set aside time for a personal project. So I turned 40 um, about a year and a half ago, and I thought, what's gonna be my legacy project? What's a project that I'm passionate about? What's something I really care about? And it was animals. So I just started to research stories about animals. Uh, I've always been fascinated with National Geographic and the stories that they do. And I thought, well, even though my career isn't built up these kind of wildlife and conservation stories and animal stories, it doesn't mean I can't start doing this now. So I just decided to say, hey, I'm gonna start this project. I'm gonna find people around the world who help animals because I'm inspired by those people. And I just started to do research. And the first project that came up, which we can get into later was the, I, the northern white rhinos, the last two northern white rhinos left in the world. So that's where I decided to launch this project. I launched it about a year ago. And at the same time I launched it is when I started to use actually Leica cameras. Before we are having a look at the, at the rhino project, um, the whole project itself, was that something that you planned in advance to do everything that you have done? Or was that something that you've grown in during doing it? Well, I, I started my career in Vietnam just doing personal projects on my own, so funded by myself and stories that I was interested in. So I had been on this journey for so long to get back to those projects. So I started to think about an idea, but I wanted an idea that I could grow into. I wanted something sort of epic, something that I could say, well, this will be my, my legacy. And so if it was just one story about a particular animal, I couldn't really grow into that. So I thought I could find these stories 
different stories around the world. So I just started to, to map out, how could this all work as one cohesive project? So I've always wanted to do a book as well. So I figured I'd make this into a book at some point. And I was so fascinated. So I started to explore, I started to do research, I started to plan. And then basically I just, it's kind of like how I started my career in Vietnam. I just, I bought a plane ticket and I just went for it. So it, ju it just happened. I mean, yeah, it happened. I, you know, these things were in my mind for a while, but it took about one of those slow weeks from commercial work or slow weeks from assignments to just actually think and put it into action. I think, you know, one of the hardest things you, as a, as a creative or as an artist or as a photographer, you, you often, you need to a lot time to actually think about your career and about what you want to do and about a project and about, you know, about your work as a whole and, and who you are as a photographer. So for me, that was just one of those moments where I, Luckily, you know, I had a week off. I had some time to think. I didn't have anything to edit, nothing to plan for. So that's when I started to research. Okay, so then um, let's not wait anymore and jump in, into your to your first series. So, um, as from from what I understood in our in our discussion uh, earlier, is that uh, this project with the with the white rhinos uh, in Africa. Um, is your your favorite one? Is that right? And and it's my first one, so it means the most to me. And it had it's probably so far it had the most impact on me because you know rhinos are so majestic and it's such a fascinating story to be down to only two of a subspecies left in the entire world. So I thought, of what a, what a better place to start? So that's this is why I started with this this project here. So this give chapter. Us I call each of these a chapter, actually. <laughs> Give us a little bit background. What 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 is happening there? Mm -hmm. I, I I know that the, the the white rhinos are more or less distinct, and uh, you said that this this is the the last couple on Earth, right? Yeah. So the background of the story is, and the way I heard about it was through National Geographic had done the story about uh, the last male Sudan when he passed away in 2018, mm -hmm. and when Sudan passed away, there was only two northern white rhinos left, and they're both at a conservation in. Kenya called Old Pajeta, a fascinating place to do great work with rhinos. So these, li these rhinos actually grew up in captivity and they're uh, Fatu and Nujin are their names and their mother and daughter and their uh, father was, and <laughs> was, um, was Sudan when he passed away. So Sudan passed away leaving two, two northern white rhinos behind, two females. Now, you know, might think that's the end of the species, but in fact, they are actually working uh, a bunch of organizations together are working to try to save the species through artificial insemination. And mm -hmm. since I've gone there to photograph the caretakers and the actual um, protectors, the, the guards of uh, the rangers, uh, I've actually grown to make this a larger story because I went back to photograph the procedure where they're actually extracting the eggs from the, rhin from the rhinos and fertilizing them in, in, um, in Italy and then coming back to Kenya. So it's still a process. It's, they're still trying. It's a Hail Mary attempt, meaning, you know, very difficult, very odd, uh, very, very difficult, very expensive. And, but they're still trying to save the species. So it grew into a bigger, a bigger story for me, actually. So as you said, it's, it's, today is not about only animals. It's also about uh, the people around the animals, the care. Yeah. So um, help us understand what what they are doing there let's say for example here we we have one of these guys um is it what, what was more important for you the the animals or the the caretakers <laughs> or, the, or the combination of both because i mean this is the main story right the core of the yeah and th that's that is lucas that's the core of this of this story it's the connection the bond that people have with these animals i am trying kindred guardians is all about people that have <laughs> these connections people that are dedicating their lives you know going above and beyond uh, to I'm looking for these odd and amazing and incredible stories of people who, who, who really focus their entire life on helping one animal. It can be anything, you know, it can be any animal. But for, for me, it's finding these people that have this bond, people that have these special connections, either an individual or an organization. So these guys here for the Rhino series, they are caretakers. They, I focused on the caretakers and the rangers. The rangers are armed. A couple of rangers protect uh, about... 20 something or, or maybe more now, but they protect the entire conservation, but they're armed rangers. They're protecting the rhinos from poachers. Also protecting these two rhinos who are in captivity from poachers as well. Uh, it's, they're protected 24 seven. They've been fired upon. Uh, a couple of the guys I followed have actually had to shoot and kill poachers. Uh, they've risked their lives. They camp out in the wild overnight, uh, risking their lives being around wild animals. It, so it's, it's a, it was a perfect, uh, project to start with because you know not only are these guys just amazing people but they're risking their lives they're spending more time with these animals than they are with their actual families 
but these people for example this is their job right so because yeah. when we're having a look at the, at the caretakers later i think some of them are also doing that on a volunteerial base but these people are um, are hired to do it right so yes yeah, some in my project some are hired some some volunteer some use their own money in this particular chapter of the white rhinos these men are hired um it's a job for them but a lot of them you can see the passion it comes through i, I tend to focus on people that that have that passion. This is Peter. He's 47 years old. He's been he's been doing it for a long time. And Zachariah, one of the other uh, rangers, you'll see these guys have an attachment. They have emotion when they're performing the surgery on the on the rhinos. I mean, they didn't even necessarily have to be there, but they're there holding the rhinos. They're there looking after them. There is a bond. There is a connection, and that's kind of what the focus of my project is: finding that bond and connection. Because I'm not a wildlife photographer. I'm sort of a weird class. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a documentary photographer. So I, I look for that connection with people. People is, is my narrative, but this is the connection with people and animals. So for my chapter and for my uh, subjects for it to work for my project, they need to have that bond with the animals. They need to have an intimate connection. And I'm looking to capture those intimate moments. You said that, um, the both rhinos that they have, the last two, they are both females. And uh, if I'm yeah. right, it, it seems to be uh, they will die at a certain point and, and there will no, will there be any baby rhinos? Is that, is that possible? <laughs> well, so, we, or or we is it so. possible that this species will, uh, will be distinct? So I, I went back to cover the procedure. The story was published in the Washington Post um, and they're still attempting the procedure. So they're collecting uh, eggs right now. They're fertilizing them. And they will try to impregnate a southern white rhino, so it won't have, won't be a pure species of northern white rhinos. But they are trying to still keep it going. So I'm holding out hope. There's still a chance. Uh, the people that are doing this are are amazing. You know, the caretakers and the scientists and everyone involved, all the organizations involved. It's an expensive uh, process and it's very difficult. It hasn't been done before, so it's very innovative. Um, so I'm holding hope still. Um, but it's sad, yeah, because I've seen this story and how it started. I live in Vietnam where people have actually, you know, consumed the horn. I photographed mafia uh, illegal wildlife traders years ago for uh, for Time magazine and then later for the United Nations. I've seen people, you know, and, and why these animals are in these situations because people are cutting off these horns. They're executing, they're executing these rhinos. And for me, it's important to get these stories out too because maybe people don't have a connection with animals. Maybe people say, I don't care. It's just a rhino. What do I care if this can cure my cancer, which it doesn't, by the way. The, the horn doesn't do anything proven medically, but if I can get people to care about humans that are risking their lives or about the men in these pictures who, who take care of these animals every day, then maybe there's a hope that people will change their attitude or the younger generation will change their attitude about illegal wildlife trade. Is there any specific reason why especially these white rhinos have been hunted so much in the past? Or is there I no. mean, I, it's a general problem with, with hunting rhinos or in general hunting wildlife in Africa, but why is especially this species um, so de decreased in, in the number? It's a combination of loss of loss of habitat and loss and obviously and poaching, but uh, which isn't necessarily exclusive to the northern white rhinos. But yeah, a lot of a lot of rhino populations have have gone down significantly. The northern white rhinos just tend to be yeah down to down to only two, which is quite sad. Which I find quite impressive when having the, the first look at these pictures. I mean, we see it over here and also in the in the next one, how close um, these rangers are to the rhinos. So yeah. I would encounter a rhino in the wildlife, I, I would maybe uh, <laughs> increase my, my speed uh, as uh, yeah, it was possible. And it yeah. seems they, they are very calm, very friendly. So, um, and also, I mean, of course, they are used to the rangers, but I, I yes. think they're used to you and you are also having been very close to, to this. So how, how is that possible? Yeah, and it's good that you bring that up because it's important to understand that these are not wild rhinos. These northern white rhinos grew up in captivity their entire lives. They grew up in a zoo in Czechoslovakia and they've lived the last uh, decade or more at the conservation. They still live in a, they have a lot of area to roam, but it's still a confined area that they live in. So. They have grown up differently. If you encounter a, a rhino in the wild, stay away. It's dangerous. They can charge. They, uh, you can get run over and, and, and possibly killed. So this is a different situation. Uh, most people that go and visit there, they're not allowed to get too close. They have an electric fence that people can go around and see from a distance. I was lucky to get this kind of close access. And for me, it took time. I spent about eight days there on my first trip. 
and it took time to get close to them. They have to get used to you. You have to follow what the what the caretakers say. These guys do have a connection with the rhinos. You can see they can tell them to stop and slow down or back off or scare them off. I mean, they have that bond with them, and I would just go off of their cues. If I was getting too close, they would warn me. And then after a few days in, the rangers didn't have to warn me. The rhinos, I could sense when they were warning me, <laughs> you're getting too close. <laughs> so you, you do feel it out just like you would with a person. You know, you know when to get close, when someone's annoyed, when someone wants you closer, farther away. So it took time, it took patience, but you know, that's what good documentary photography is all about. So have, have you been afraid? I mean, standing so close to, to a to <laughs> sure. rhino? Sure. I mean, two, two big moments for me, like when I first saw these rhinos up close and I first touched them with my own hand and what, a, that was one of the, you know, biggest moments of my life. It was, it was, it was sad because at one point, you know, I, I, I'm thinking back of where I live. I'm thinking back of the consumption side. I'm thinking back of how beautiful these animals are and why they're going extinct, but it was also so beautiful to be present and so close to them and a big moment for me to start this journey. And then, you know, you, it's easy to get comfortable and get close after a few days, but when they, when they sit down, they do so slow when they stand up, uh, it happens fast. So I was scared a few times. Luckily I travel with light gear. So I got light, light gear so I can stand up and get out of the way pretty quickly. But yeah, it, you, you have to be very careful. And you know, when I, when I camped out, uh, into the evening with the, with the rangers, that's scary too, because there's wild animals or even, you know, you could have people with guns trying to kill the rangers, trying to kill the animals. It's, it, it gave me a good insight to, you know, how risky these guys, their job is and, and, and how passionate they are and what they do. I mean, it's, it, it's easy to say it's just a job for them, but a lot of these guys, it's not just a job. It's, it's you know, it's their purpose in life. They feel um, a sense of pride protecting these animals and they feel a sense of pride protecting the wildlife of Kenya. And it's also, you know, a big part of the uh, tourism industry in Kenya is people going on safaris and things like that. So you know, there's a big sense of pride with what these guys do. And I really, after spending time with them, respected them even more than I did going into it. So, for example, uh, especially this picture, which, by the way, I think that the perspective is very nice here because it shows on, on one way, like the, the gentle and calm rhino and then uh, <laughs> the, the weapon uh, soldier or the, the guard standing beside the rhino. So, yeah. um, first question, um, is, is that, is like these kind of photos, is that... Uh, what you are looking for, especially to, to combine, for example, certain elements in a, in a photo, for example, here, the weapon and the rhino, or was sure. there? And, it, and, and it's hard because the normal, the normal caretakers don't always, um, the normal caretakers with the rhinos don't carry guns, but the rangers carry guns and they walk through these fields and they wander around these areas. So with this in particular, yeah, it was just a great moment with these guys sort of uh, hanging out and talking to the caretakers and on their, on their stroll and they have these weapons. So I just, I wanted to frame them through to show that. And it's a picture that I get a lot of comments, a lot of questions about, which is what I want as a photographer. I want people to say, I want people to want to know more. I want to introduce an issue, introduce a topic, but sometimes you don't have many photos to do it. This for me, I can accomplish everything I wanted in one shot, which, which is, you know, which is nice. I, I like to have long form. I like to have a photo story of 25 to 30 pictures, but if I can get a shot that makes people want to look at more or want to read more, then, then that's, you know, that's, that's a bonus for me. And I feel like that kind of happened here because of, you know, getting these different layers in the shot. Oh, very interesting, actually. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. So before we are having a look at your next picture, I would also like to welcome everybody who has joined us a little bit later. Uh, uh, welcome to the, to the Leica conversation today uh, with Justin Mott and his series Kinded Guardians. Um, and also, uh, what I what I like to uh, mention here, we have some special announcement to make later on at the end of the session. So um, I hope you stay with us until the end. Um, and uh, Justin, uh, we have already some questions which sure. I would like to to jump in right here. Um, and the first question was from Willie. Uh, hi, Willie. Welcome. And. Uh, he mentioned that uh, Leica is not really known for having the, the right equipment for, for uh, wildlife photography, so long tail lens and stuff like that, um, which I think we, we have in a certain kind of way. So if a, uh, yeah, if a customer would come to our store and ask for, um, for a camera which you can use in safari or wildlife photography, I would maybe recommend him the Deluxe, so uh, sure. a camera with a very long focal length. But I know that you are not using the Deluxe, right? You're using something very untypically for wildlife photography. So what is that? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And this is something that people love to talk to me about. And it's kind of funny. And, and I have a lot of funny stories about this. But I use, uh, I started this project where I wanted to shift in my career in, in the content that I was shooting. And I wanted to switch up my gear and my setup. So I had started my career years ago in film and I used an M6. And I remember how great that felt in my hand. And I remember missing that uh, film aspect and sort of being in the moment. And when I saw the M10D, I thought, okay, this is crazy. It's a camera that doesn't have a screen. It's expensive. And then I thought, okay, but it's, the more I researched, I started to be intrigued by this camera. So I tested it in Singapore. I took it out for the day. Like a Singapore was wonderful to let me borrow it for, for an afternoon. And I fell in love with it right away. Uh, I, fell in love, I felt like I did when I first started my career doing documentary. Like I wanted a camera that, it sounds crazy, but that would restrict me and make me move more. You know, if I'm just sitting there in one location, I'm likely to not get this close. I'm likely to pick stories that I don't have to get close to the subject. But having a camera like a Leica, I use probably 90% of my pictures are with a 35 millimeter. It forces me to get close to my subjects. It forces me to pick subjects that I need to get close to. I'm not looking for those wildlife shots of a perfect, you know, like a 70 to 200 or 400 millimeter lens of just, just an animal in the wild. Those are great shots, but that's not my photography. That's not what I want to do with my photography. And I'm looking to capture life daily and moments daily and natural stories. And so for that, for me, it requires me to move. It requires me to get close. And having a fixed 35 millimeter, that's how I started my career. So it's kind of full circle going back to that. It does make me move more. It makes me think a lot more. And the other thing, it just makes me really present. I'm not looking at my screen. It sounds crazy, but I used to look at my screen too much. I used to, you know, go through functions all the time. And now I'm just, I just, this camera's awesome for me because I'm just setting ISO, I'm setting my aperture, I'm setting my shutter, and that's, I'm done. You know, I can turn the camera on, it's ready to go, it's lightweight. Also, I spend full days with, with my subjects. I'm out there at 4.30 a.m. to drive to meet these guys where they open up the, you know, the gates to let me in at 5 a.m. for sunrise. I don't want a camera that's going to weigh me down all day. You know, I've done that in my life. I do that with commercial work. So it's funny using this gear, very limited gear. I do also carry a 75 with me and a 135. Occasionally I use it. But typically, I don't need to. Those are just for emergencies. I, I, most of my subjects, again, I, I do a lot of research. I talk to them. I make sure it's ethical. I make sure it's safe. You know, I don't want to get close to a line if it's going to hurt someone else or hurt myself. Um, but if they do, if there's a reason for them to get close to the animals, like this situation, these aren't wild rhinos. If they weren't, I wouldn't like the fact that they get close to it. it makes sense. It turned out to be a blessing. The camera, for me, it just it was a natural fit. And it's funny, when I show up on these stories, and people see I have a, you know, I have a pretty good list of uh, clients I've worked for with Nat Geo and, and uh, New York Times and Washington Post. And they see me with this tiny camera and they're like, oh, I, I don't think we've got the right guy here or is this guy serious? <laughs> and so it's, it's kind of a funny, funny thing. People don't take me serious, especially in places like Kenya where everyone's got these gigantic lenses and I'm sitting there walking in. But for me, my, my long lens is my access. <laughs> I mean, I totally understand the approach of, of getting close. And I, I know that a lot of uh, photographers, they, they share that when it comes to people. But when it comes to wildlife animals, as you said, uh, if you if you want to shoot wildlife lions, that would maybe not a good idea to use a 35. <laughs> yeah. story, uh, For me, I would, see, I would seek out a story where it would make sense. It could be a veterinarian that takes care of lions or lions that maybe can't go back into the wild for one reason or another, you know, if they were kept in captivity or if they were injured and things like that. So... Almost the, the camera forces me into finding the right stories that suit my project. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on to the to the next one. Um, maybe before we, we talk about the picture, we have another question from sure. uh, Melvin. Um, and if I understand right, he's asking um, if you if you can share a little bit about the, the general process of that project. Uh, How much did you how much did you plan how much did you predict and uh, did it came out as you as you wanted or did you did you discover that it that it was something else in the end that uh, what you expected in the beginning Yeah it's it's growing I didn't expect for me to answer the last question first is it's I don't know where it's still going to go it's an ongoing project I will do one book I think now I'm thinking about making it into multiple books. So it has grown beyond what I thought it would be, actually. I, I did have this idea to, for it to be a big project, but I didn't realize how much I would be in love with these kind of stories. And my process for this the project is kind of my process when I started my career is I'm just at a different stage in my career. I, I do commercial photography to fund these kind of projects. So, you know, I'm not making much money off of these. I do pitch these stories 
two publications afterwards, but that barely pays for the expenses. Sometimes it equals out, most of the time it doesn't, but none of these are financial decisions. These kind of stories, you know, the Rhino story is a lot more likely to be published around the world than some of my other stories, but it doesn't matter to me as much. I, I donate all the images to the people and to the organizations. The idea for me is to raise awareness with these stories, to highlight the people uh, and show the work they're doing and hopefully make people more interested in their work and hopefully donate and help and hopefully, you know, bring, bring people awareness to some of the issues with wildlife conservation and the illegal wildlife trade and celebrate these people. So it's grown for me. It's, it's, I've never had a project I'm more passionate about in my life. I've never had anything I'm more exciting about photographically. <laughs> um, and it sort of sparked me again in my, my career. So my process is each, each story, I, in the beginning, I would research uh, just looking for things that interest me. But now I'm kind of flooded on Instagram and, and Facebook with, with great story ideas. I meet people in the wildlife industry that can help me sort of filter stories to make sure, okay, these people are doing the right thing. These people maybe aren't doing the right thing. And so that has led me to all these other great stories. So it's kind of just snowballed for me. Um, help me to, to understand a little bit more. So you, you donate the pictures that you take and your mm -hmm. approach is to increase the awareness uh, for, for example, projects like this. Do you also uh, kind of like do crowdfunding or, or try to collect money from, uh, from people to, uh, to give the money to these people or organizations? I help them use the photos to do that. So when I each, after each chapter of the project, I will feature my photo story. So about 25 to 30 pictures, and I will put one picture a day on my Instagram. So hopefully my, my uh, followers go to their followers, <laughs> or, or my followers go to their websites and want to help. And then I've done things with, with the old Pajetta, with the Northern White Rhinos. We've, I've, I've gone, I've flown there on my own money to, to document uh, the procedure and then I donate the photos to them to use for media outlets for press releases for the website And then I, I do my best on my social media outlets and then I do my best to pitch the stories around to to publications so far the Washington Post has been very uh, Interested in this project. They've published two chapters and plan to publish maybe three more and Greenpeace in Germany has published it and uh, Paris match they've had some great feedback National Geographic in Portugal did an article about the story so I, I do all that after I do the story. I do it the way that I want it to, you know, I pick the stories that, that fit my project. I pick stories that I'm, I'm interested in. And then I pitch the stories around to publications afterwards. But yeah, I donate the pictures for them to use how they want. Sometimes it's unconventional. Sometimes they, they sell prints for fundraisers, which they've been successful with. Um, there's different ways. So yeah, I just, I just, I just try to help them They're You know, everyone's a little bit cautious with that. And I know photographers don't like giving their work away. And I believe in an honest, an honest day's you know, pay for an honest day's work. But this, these are stories that I'm interested in doing. They're letting me into their lives. So I contacted them, they didn't contact me. So that's why I feel very comfortable uh, giving them my, my images because my thing is I want to help in the end, play my part. Amazing, honestly. Great. Thank you. So then let's go on to, to the next one. And um, now we have some animals, which is not so dangerous to, to shoot with a, with a short uh, photo. Well, you'd be surprised. <laughs> so, so, so we, we, we switched the continent now from, uh, from Africa to uh, your, your, our close neighbor, Malaysia. Yes. So um, this is a gibbon, right? Yep, this is a gibbon. And the woman here is, her name is Bam. And she's a former wildlife ranger in, in Malaysia. She left her job after disagreements with how the how that department sort of handled the, the, the gibbons. She started her own operation, um, her own sort of jungle school, if you will, taking on rescued gibbons, taking on gibbons that were abandoned or injured gibbons, and then working on rehabilitating them back into the wild. She started when I was there, she was operating uh, illegally. Now she does have all the correct permits to do all this. Uh, she's a wonderful, passionate person. She's the kind of person that embodies what my project is all about. She inspired me. I mean, just to be there and watch her day in, day out. She has a group of volunteers. She uses her own money. Um, you know, given trade, it, it's a lot deeper and a lot more complicated than you think. People take gibbons in Malaysia and other parts of the world, but she just focuses on Malaysia as pets. And they are adorable, but they're not meant to be pets. They're meant to be in the wild. They get older, they get bigger, they go around. People don't want them anymore. Um, also, the illegal... Uh, wildlife traders that capture these gibbons people don't understand is that to capture a baby gibbon you might have to kill seven or eight of a whole family of gibbons so 
you know, there's a combination of the Gibbons from, from deforestation um, and from the illegal pet trade. And she's just, she's, she's not only helping rescue them, she's also helping on the enforcement side. She's worked with, now that she has a good relationship with the government, she works with them to help, you know, catch people selling them on Facebook and on Instagram. She's had her life threatened many times. I mean, can you imagine? She's, she's sitting here helping these animals day in and day out. And, you know, pet traders are, 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 are threatening her life because, you know, they're exposing of what they're, of, of the horrible things that they're doing. So she's a fascinating person. She has a lot of fight in her and a big heart. And she was perfect for this project. And you said she's doing that on a voluntary base, right? So Yeah, she started herself. She works off of her own money and private donations, you know. And then again, once this is done, I gave her images and, and she uses them. And, and we try to, you know, I try to promote her, her cause. And her story was also published in the Washington Post. She's a fascinating woman. She met Jane Goodall recently. She's, uh, she's so fascinating. When I first went to find her place, though, it was like uh, we couldn't say where we were. I couldn't post any pictures or any coordinates because it was operating completely illegally. Plus, she has to be careful because, you know, people will try to come and, and steal the gibbons and hurt her. But what, what, what is that with the gibbons? I mean, you said that, that, that she has been... Uh frightened by, by, by the, the wildlife hunters and uh, they try yeah, to she'll turn them in from her, which uh, I, I, I think like, I mean, when, when I had a, a, look, a look at those pictures um, previously, I intentionally, I thought that somewhere in the jungle in the middle of nowhere, but it's basically uh, near Kuala Lumpur, right? So in the city. So why would somebody steal uh, monkeys from her? <laughs> No, no, the pictures in the city was when she was going for her court case hearing. So she, this center is a few hours outside of Kale. So she does have, she did have to go to the court a few times. And that was a moment I was lucky to be there to capture, you know, as a documentary photographer, you, you, you hang out, you stay, you look for everything. And I was, I was leaving that one day and she was heading to the city and I said, can I follow you? Can I come to the court case? And, you know, I captured that little moment of her outside because she hadn't, she thought she was going to be granted her permit. She thought she was going to win the case and it was basically postponed. So it was quite a, emotional moment for her. Luckily, since then, she has gotten everything she needed and she will start the first ever official given rehabilitation center in Malaysia. So she rebuil rehabilitates them, which means teaching them how to be live in the jungle again, um, live in the wild and slowly, slowly a soft release. And it's hard for her because she raises them in her house. It's important to point out the pictures of her that she's inside of her house with them, that that's only for about the first two years or so while she has to hand feed them. She's not keeping them as pets. She's rescuing them from people that are keeping those pets. But, you know, she would, she would be mad if I didn't point that out. And I would be mad at myself if I didn't point that out. These moments are just the first couple of years while she's, she's driving them from where she keeps them at her house to the jungle school that she's set up. So she's not keeping them around as pets. She's releasing them back into the wild. And it's, it's funny. It's like, this is a moment for me. She's driving her kids to school. That's the way she would describe it. And that's what she does. It's funny you say that because this was also something I was, I was thinking like, is this maybe a replacement for, for kids? Because, I mean, you said that she wants to release them into the wildlife, but in these pictures, uh, it seems that they are very close to them. So it, at the first step, it must be hard for her to release it them. It is, the yeah. world. And second step, it must be also uh, like kind of difficult to release them into the wildlife when they have been in such a close contact to a human. It's hard. She starts, you know, a little bit close, but then over time, she slowly sort of wins them off uh, human contact. And that's part of the process. And she's, you know, she went to Europe to train with different zoos there to understand this process, to understand primates more. And she's, she, she's fantastic at it. It's really hard for her. She told me it's, it's one of the most difficult things, but she knows how happy they are in the wild and how much they just want to uh, swing from branches and play and be in the wild. And Gibbons also, one little other little fact that might be interesting, Gibbons have the most beautiful songs. They sing these beautiful songs. So if you ever hear them in the wild, it's, it's, it's such a pleasure to hear. Couldn't capture that in the photograph, but it was amazing to hear. They are also very loud, right? So when you hear them in yes. the jungle. <laughs> um, very this, loud. This picture here is, uh, is very uh, suitable to add in another question um, yes. from, uh, from Ricky. Um, so he's asking, how often, how often do you use flash when you, uh, when you work in uh, low light situations, for example, like here? I, I think this is not made with a flash. So in general, do you do your work with flash or any other never. equipment besides <laughs> of your camera? Never, never for my documentary work do I use flash. I, I, I can't think of any time in my 
great. I, of course, use, I use lighting for my commercial photography, which is completely different. But for all my documentary work, I use, I, I use the M10D. I use a 35 1.4, which is an awesome camera in low light. You know, 1.4. I shoot wide open quite often. Uh, I will crank up my ISO pretty, pretty high. Uh, and then I just look for little beams of natural light and expose for the highlights. So here I'm just looking for those, you know, interesting little light coming through. This is one of the, one of the volunteers holding one of the gibbons before it goes to bed at, at their uh, donated sort of apartment in the, in the jungle. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't use it much. I rely on, I, I love ambient light. I like things to happen naturally. I like my pictures to have a natural feel to them. And so I use natural light for everything. Do you have some kind of tips and tricks for, for our guests here? Uh, I know that uh, a lot of people, they always like to hear some uh, advice from a photographer when it comes to photography with M and manual focusing. So mm. how do you do it? Do you always look through the rangefinder or do you do zone focusing? You uh, only use one aperture, for example, open aperture, or you also stop down sometimes. Is there a particular way of the just in what way of doing it? <laughs> I don't think I have anything super special to share. I just tend to, you know, without, without the, without the uh, screen on the back of my camera, I do have to rely on my instincts and I have to rely on, on you know, my, my education in photography, but I did learn the proper way. You know, I did learn with a manual camera. So I, I do look through the rangefinder, uh, through the viewfinder. And then I often, if, if it's a tricky situation with a lot of different layers and the focus is, is having a hard problem, for instance, I'm shooting through fences often, I like to create layers of my images, I will just go with distance on the lens. You know, I, I, you start to get a feel for how far and if I don't know, I'll check really quickly, okay, that's about three meters away and I make a judgment call. I overshoot when I'm shooting something at 1.4. You know, if I'm shooting 1.4 and I really want those eyes to be sharp, which I do every time, um, then I will just kind of, I will overshoot. I'll move a little bit. I'll take one shot and move a tiny bit, take another shot. So I, I do trust my focus and my vision, but just to be careful, uh, key moments like this that, you know, it's nothing's moving. So I have a little time to, to make it happen. And then other times if I'm following people around and they're moving a lot or things are happening, I don't tend to shoot at 1.4. I might shoot at F6 to give myself a little bit of leeway. But, but the I, camera's I, been accurate and the lens has been accurate for me all the time. I was scared the first time I used it. I thought I was going to come back with these pictures. You know, I shot at 1.4 that were out of focus. And you'd be surprised too. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes you get a shot that was out of focus. It sounds crazy, but it ends up being kind of a beautiful shot. Or, you know, rather than, rather than looking at your viewfinder and spending time thinking about that stuff, you end up just taking another shot that you might not have seen. Or, you, you, you know... The other thing I love about a 35 is I tend to move more. I look around more and I, I'm um, obviously, like I said before, I'm a lot more present as well. And I think as, as also a lot of things in life, everything a matter of, of practicing. So, yeah, I mean, I, I know that some, some people are afraid when it comes to first, uh, first using the M for example, but everybody that I've met so far after a while, they are totally convinced. So some of them, they, they also say like they, they can focus faster or better than the autofocus. So uh, they are really confident after a while. I feel that way. And, and I just, I honestly feel that like everything for me since I started using this kit is I slow down in exactly how I started in photography. I mean, I don't have time to slow down on commercial shoots. I don't often have time to slow down on assignments, but a personal project for me is a time to explore with your photography. It's a time to like try different things and time to actually fail. You can fail and make mistakes. You know, I give myself several days so it all comes together. I might have a great day with the Gibbons and some great moments, but the light was bad. Then the next day the light's great, but she didn't do anything interesting or nothing visually interesting. So, you know, I, I give myself time with my personal projects and I give myself, the camera makes me slow down and think a lot more too, because I'm just looking around a lot more. I'm not worried about, oh, I've got this camera, I've got this, where's my lens bag with all that stuff in it. I've just got this camera on my neck and maybe two lenses with me, sometimes none, sometimes just a camera strap and a camera and a lens. And that's all I'm worried about is I'm just observing and getting ready with, it's so easy with two cameras and everything to be going all over the place and, and thinking about, oh, should I use my 7200? Should I use my 2470? This makes me think about what is happening in front of me? What's the moment? What's the story? And what am I trying to capture? Okay, so for everybody who came in a little bit later, uh, hello to you again, and don't worry, uh, we have still a lot to discover today with Justin, so you, you don't miss too much. And um, yeah, oh, sorry, um, we go on to your, to your next 
project. So it seems like uh, a little bit like a gym for dogs to be to be fit. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a dog on a treadmill. <laughs> So, this so where are you, which country is this, and and what is the what is the background? This is in Thailand, and this is a very born, uh, famous organization that I'd heard of for many years, living in Southeast Asia and doing a lot of assignments in Thailand, called the Soy Dog Foundation, and they focus on they focus on helping uh, street dogs, which there's a lot of in these tourist towns. So street dogs throughout um, throughout Phuket, but they also work out throughout Thailand. They're also focused on stopping the dog meat trade, which is dog meat consumption in countries like Vietnam and China as well. Uh, and a lot of the dogs are actually wrangled and captured in Thailand and trucked over the border through uh, through Laos and into Vietnam. So quite a crazy project that they do. Uh, their, their whole thing is is sterilizing dogs and taking care of of street dogs that have been injured, been abused. You know, people don't treat these dogs very well. I was there when a dog was brought in after he was stabbed. Uh, dogs that are brought in that were hit by cars with hip injuries. And when I went to go do this story in particular, I wasn't sure where I was gonna focus. I knew the organization was great, but I couldn't figure out what my story was ahead of time because I'd heard different things. I heard about this great elderly man who was in his late seventies who volunteers there, but he was wonderful and he does amazing things, but he was essentially, most of his time was picking up poop which doesn't photograph that well. I stumbled into the veterinarian unit and I saw the uh, physical therapy department and these two women, one w lady from Germany, another one from, uh, from Thailand, and they were helping dogs with this hydrotherapy machine. I thought this is fascinating. So I, I, followed, I documented them day in and day out and visually it's not a great place. It's a tiny little room with not, you know, with really ugly fluorescent light, but I thought the work they were doing was powerful. I thought people would find it interesting. And again, they fit exactly what I'm what I'm trying to do. I want to bring stories that some stories might be more conventional, like okay, rangers helping rhinos, but things like this, uh, you know, even dogs. You think, well, how are people helping dogs? Maybe they're volunteering and walking them. But this I thought was interesting. They, you know, doing hydrotherapy with the dogs. They do acupuncture with the dogs, and they have wheelchairs for the dogs. So I spent a couple of days with them, documenting them, and yeah, it was touching. It's sad to see to see you know all these dogs in these conditions, but it's amazing to see people like this that are doing great things. And this place is very well funded, you know, I think because a lot, most people can connect with dogs. They have a connection with dogs from their childhood or even, even their adulthood. And so they can relate. So they are very well funded and the people do amazing work here. But I'm curious, um, who's paying for this? I mean, uh, okay, <laughs> Donations. the previous one we, we saw, uh, if, you, if you buy food, uh, uh, for example, for, for animals, it's one thing uh, if you do it by yourself. But this kind of equipment, I think no one is able to afford just just to to help stray dogs i mean yeah uh, well you'd be amazed <laughs> you'd be amazed at how much you know the population across the world has a common bond in a care for dogs and cats i mean it's one of those things that you, you, you there's a reason why you know dog instagram accounts or cat videos are the most likely <laughs> watched thing people care about them they have a connection with them and then they can they can relate so this place they're genuine they do amazing work they get all of their money from private donations people sponsor dogs uh, they have a great marketing campaign, but really it's, you know, good work and they get good money for it so that it, it works out well. And what's happening uh, when, when the dog uh, has recovered? Do they release them back to the streets? I mean, I, I, I don't see this as a solution for the main problem, right? Yeah, it's tough. So, so their main thing is sterilization of the dog. So they have brought the street dog population down quite significantly. Some of the dogs that can live a better life in the wild, if they caught them near uh, I also catch them, but if they found them injured or someone called in, uh, you know, an injured dog, then they'll release them back. If they're healthy and they're back, okay to go back, they'll release them back to the area that they, that they were. If it's a dog that can be adopted or a dog that's injured that can't go back into the, well, you know, back into the wild, I guess you call it, they will keep them there. They have volunteers that come in, backpackers that come in and take the dogs for daily walks. They have a whole department for where people can play with the puppies. Uh, so they're they're you know working heavily in adoption and heavily in sterilization to to sort of minimize the street dog population. But isn't isn't the street dog more a wild animal than a, a than an animal to to cuddle with and having having puppies to to touch and stuff like that? I mean, I think for puppies not a problem, but if I I would not feel so uh, so comfortable touching a street dog in the first place. Yeah, well, it's a good question. It's a valid, valid thought. But the, what they have there actually is some of these, they, they go through a very heavily uh, intensive like, screening process for the dog. So they have dogs that they will work with a behaviorist. And these people like specialize in, 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 in working with dogs and the psychology of dogs and trying to understand if this dog will bite, if this dog is, uh, 
mainly bite, but if they're, yeah, how they're going to react to humans. So they have these therapists that will work months and years with some of these dogs to bring them up for adoption. So, you know, they treat each dog like a, you know, a person. <laughs> so it's, it's quite amazing. So the dogs that are released and the dogs that are adopted are, are sort of certified that, you know, they will be okay around kids. They will be okay around people. So this one, uh, this is the, the lady from Germany that you mentioned, right? Yes. <laughs> is, is, she, is she doing ex exercising with the, with the dog? Yeah, she's teaching him how to use the dog has two broken hips, so it's not going to be able to walk. So he's teaching this dog how to, you know, how to walk using this wheelchair that they made with, I think, PVC pipes. And you know, they get so things donated and they make things there. Next. What's that? She, she, mot she motivates him to, to walk uh, with, with. Yeah, those are, that's a bag of treats there, a, a jar of treats. And she, you know, she's another one of these people. She started there as a volunteer and became a full time employee. You know, she had no background as a veterinarian, no background in physical therapy with dogs. And she, she learned from the other woman there, the Thai woman, and she fell in love with her job and it had meaning and, and she stayed and she's been there for several years. So before we go on to your next series, uh, we have another question from Denny. Uh, I, sure. I, didn't, I didn't forget you. Um, he's asking, um, or oh, first he, he, he said that uh, he, he very likes uh, the dynamic range, not in, in this one, was the, uh, some of the previous pictures. And uh, he's asking, um, how much do you, do you post-process your pictures, especially when it comes yeah, not, to dynamic range and color? Not a lot. I do everything in, I do everything in Lightroom. I don't use Photoshop. Um, I, I, I'm not, I subscribe to sort of journalistic ethics for my project, even though it's a personal project and for my own book. The, a lot of the chapters, and a lot of the pictures are published in, you know, in, in major media outlets. So I subscribe to sort of, you know, what the New York Times would do and what, what um, Washington Post would do, which is minor color correction. And that's about it. I'm never, never cloning anything out, never removing anything like that. Uh, I, I'm not setting up these shots. I'll, I'll set up a portrait if it's, you know, known to set up, but I shoot completely documentary style. I follow these people around, I wait for moments to happen. And then in post-production, I'm using, I'm using Lightroom and I, I edit my stories with an editor friend of mine because I like to get another perspective uh, on how to edit the project. And so, but that's the sequencing, not the toning of the photos, but so very, very minimum. And everything is color, color, not, it's different for my commercial work, completely different. Sure, but we, we don't talk about commercial ones like- Right. <laughs> I, 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 I totally agree. I, I really like them. I think they, uh, they when it comes to dynamic, dynamic range, they look great and also natural in a way. So. Um, I mean, I think everybody uh, should should uh, post process their pictures as this person likes to do. I think there is no <laughs> or right or wrong. Um, I know when it comes to documentary, you try to have it as um, as natural as possible. But I mean, we are all taking photos for for ourselves, and I think if we enjoy, the most important thing is that we that we enjoy our photos and and not try to. Yeah. Uh, make it very nice for, for other people if we don't like it in first step. Absolutely. So then we're coming to your slot um, project, yeah. which, which now I, I really can uh, agree that uh, the M camera is something which <laughs> is suitable here because when they are moving so slow, um, I think uh, it's not so difficult to to get the right shot in here, but this this one is quite amazing, especially with the with the light. Uh, it looks a little bit religious, you know. That uh, yeah, the, well, this touching that. <laughs> yeah, and this was a matter of uh, they told me that this moment in particular was a was a matter of they told me they do physical therapy with this slot around sunset. So I said we got to be there in time. Uh, I want to capture that whole entire uh, therapy process. Um, but a little backstory about this this particular chapter of my project it's obviously about slots and i flew to suriname not many people know where suriname is but it's maybe i can point to my map it's just north of brazil in south america and this again is sort of the spirit of my project and how i started someone told me about this woman who looks after slots she's a friend of mine that works in wildlife conservation she works for wtg there actually and she told me about this wonderful lady in suriname who looks after slots and I said, well, tell me more. She said, well, she was a CNN hero. And she was, you know, I, I looked her up and I saw her on, you know, Anderson Cooper on CNN talking to her. And, and I thought, wow, what a fascinating woman. Would she be okay if I went photograph there? My friend introduced me to her. They, they fund her organization. Uh, they're partially funded. 
and she was okay with it. And I flew to Suriname a few months later. She said she, she can rescue sloths maybe uh, once or twice a week. I said, well, she said, I can't guarantee anything because you never know. But Suriname is a densely forested country, but as the capital city of Paramaribo expands, there's a lot of these sloths that are ending up in the city. People don't know what to do with them. They end up in their land. They're afraid of them. Uh, Three-toed and two-toed sloths are different. Uh, the two-toed sloth is nocturnal, so he's coming out at nighttime. It can scare people. They climb in their trees. She'll come, rescue them with a net. She'll take them back into sort of an area that she's scouted that is, you know, a, a natural environment for them, away from, you know, any development and hopefully away from humans. And she releases them. And she became famous for an incident that she told me about called Slothageddon, where this plot of land was developed and it was about 140 sloths and a bunch of other animals, and eaters, and different animals that people didn't know what to do with. They had nowhere to go. And she let them stay at her house until she could find a place to put them back in the wild. So what an amazing person. What a great story. And she's also, in, in some ways, very sloth-like. She moves around very slow. And so it was, it was a, a great story to do. And I did get lucky that she did rescue two sloths in the eight days that I was there. But her full days, you know, she's, she has a couple sloths that live close to her her center. Uh, one of the first days I had a great moment because she has a stuffed animal of a sloth hanging that they use for some of the babies to feel comfort if they find rescued babies. And so the first day we're out at this camp, um, her, her jungle uh, rehabilitation center far away from the city. And I thought, okay, tomorrow maybe we'll get lucky and see a sloth. And I woke up and I saw the, I remember seeing the stuffed animal and doing a double take. And I saw a real sloth next to the stuffed animal because it was a sloth that used to live uh, at her rehab center, she did a release to the, with that sloth, but he still lives close to the center. And he comes by to say hello like uh, every few weeks. So I got quite lucky to capture that. <laughs> so these are the ones that aren't as cute to some people. I think they're adorable, but this was a rescued sloth. She brought it home uh, to her, re sorry, she brought it to a rehabilitation center from the capital, which is about and a two hour drive. And in the, in the picture, this is the lady that you mentioned? Uh, yes, that's Monique. And she just would wash, wash, Wash them off. They're not easy to catch. The this sloth in particular, I had to help her capture it, which was which was not fun because I'm trying to photograph at the same time I flew halfway around the world to get photos of this lady and something that doesn't happen too often. And when it did happen, she was not screaming at me, but help, come on, please help me. So I had to, you know, photograph while I'm taking it down. Then the next day she'll wash it, clean it, check it, make sure, make sure the sloth is healthy, and then she releases it 24 hours later into the wild. I mean, honestly, this this fellow doesn't look very, uh, very happy. <laughs> no, he was scared. But when you know she released him, we we did a uh, trip down the river. She goes has this friend. A lot of these people work with friends that are you know have the same sort of. That's why I like this title, Kindred Guardians, because you meet the. They all have this kindred spirit, but even even the people that volunteer have this kindred uh, spirit as well for animals and love for animals. So. You know, she had a, a friend who has a boat and they'll drive her down, down the river and she can release the sloths back into the wild. And it's just never ending for her. I mean, these sloths are, are native to only a few places in the, in the world. And she's in Suriname, they're, they're you know, through, through um, deforestation and development. And climate change is causing a problem. So, you know, she finds sloths that are dehydrated. She's not a vet by trade. She just fell into this. She's different. She fell into this work because she had a love for animals and the animal shelter didn't know what to do. And a lot of these places, governments aren't spending a lot of money on these things. You know, there's not a sloth, you know, rehab program in Suriname. She invented it. Is it right that these sloths often get injured by, uh, by stray dogs? Uh, not often, but that one in the first picture was bitten and broke his arm and they were rehabilitating it. This is a volunteer veterinarian that works with her. This is at their uh, at their rehabilitation center outside of the city. They were checking the sloth because he looked severely uh, dehydrated. This was a sloth that she spent a long time rehabilitating. He'd been living in the wild. He would come back. And I did find out, not to be sad today, but the sloth a few months after it passed away. Sorry, people. <laughs> it was a sad story, but that's part of the the job for her. He was really dehydrated and passed away, even after they, you know, they did their best to try to rescue him. We have another question from uh, Ricky here. He's asking, um, I mean, we haven't seen any shot in, in monochrome so far. So do you shoot sometimes in monochrome and uh, uh, which, which is the uh, criteria or the, or the condition for you to, to do that? This project, I did make a decision early on to keep it in color. I just sort of think about each project and, and what the visuals are going to be and what I want to capture. I, I, I knew I do shoot in black and white sometimes. I have done it for certain stories. 
that you know, I, I did a story about Agent Orange victims of Vietnam, and I felt it worked for black and white because it was very, very emotional, very powerful. This, uh, this story to me has a, I hope a happier. I mean, there's a lot of sad undertones, but there's a, there's uh, a hint of optimism in, in, in the world because these people are doing such wonderful things. So I wanted to, I wanted to shoot this in color. I had the ideas right from the beginning, and, and I'm glad I made that decision. You know, I, I won't convert just some to black and white because I. I like a fluidity and I like it to be cohesive. So I'll keep this in color. But yeah, certain projects, if they lend themselves to to black and white, it's project, it's case by case with me. But this I felt lend itself to color very well. Okay, so let's have a look at the at your next project, which I think a lot of people will will like. It's uh, the the baby elephant. So um, yeah. it, this ranger, it seems that she's she's uh, he's sleeping with the with the elephant. Is that because he has uh, no other place to go or is it necessary <laughs> the elephants? no they don't want to sleep in there it doesn't smell great for starters <laughs> and even baby elephants are quite big and can knock you over so this is the sheldrick trust which is a uh, organization that they do a lot of work but in particular i wanted to focus on their orphaned elephant uh, rehab center which is in nairobi uh, i was already in kenya quite a bit for the rhino project i heard about sheldrick trust i did a little bit of research to make sure you know they're you know, they're doing good things. A lot of elephant organizations, you never know what their motives are. This place does amazing work. Everyone had great things to say about them. They're very well funded, very hard to get access to um, because they do get a lot of media requests because it is such a visual place. A funny story here is they wanted to give me about an hour and I said, I'm not flying to Nairobi from Vietnam for an hour. Can you give me a day? And then I talked to them for two days and then I talked to them in three days. And so a little tip for photographers out there is, you know, I, I even have a, a pretty good resume to get in with them and they still weren't that interested. But after I showed them some pictures, after they showed them that I'm not just taking like, you know, they have so many pictures of tight shots of elephants and, and things like that. But I said, listen, I want that emotional connection. I want to capture the stories of the caretakers. This is what my project is about. And they, they eventually opened up to me and let me stay and I've been invited to come back. So you know, these guys are great. The organization is great. This this particular chapter is less about an individual and more about the organization. But these men, they spend all day with these elephants. The elephants come in because they've either been abandoned by the herd, uh, their parents have been killed by poachers, they've been caught in snares. Um, and they spend, I mean, the, the time that they put in to get these elephants back into the wild, they start here at the Nairobi Center. Then they have an integration camp, not uh, another part of Kenya. And then they eventually want to release them back into the wild, but that process can take years and the elephants have to be ready. So these caretakers aren't just feeding the elephants, they're logging their behavior, they're watching them, they're keeping uh, diaries on them. And they're also writing like little diaries for the, for the donors. That's how they receive such great funding because places like this, it's very expensive to take care of elephants. And they sleep with them because people ask that because baby elephants need that, need that connection. And they sleep with them because they also have to feed them every few hours. They feed them milk. So they sleep overnight with them. They're there for them. It's sort of to, elephants are really about a sense of family and being close. So they want to create that nice nurturing atmosphere for, for the elephants. So yeah, they rotate. These men sleep several nights in a row and then the other caretakers will sleep. And so each stall has a different elephant that they stay with. So coming back to the, to the topic that we've talked earlier about with the, with the M, I think this picture is a great example that uh, that you have some arguments to to use the M camera because the the light here uh, the light situation the shadow here is amazing and I think this this situation is really something uh, which which uh, your gear is really really good and suitable for right yeah this was a tricky one because I actually hadn't tested up until this point I hadn't shot much in in really low light like this because the rhino story a lot of it was during the day and beautiful you know. Uh, African sunsets, <laughs> Kenyan sunsets. So for me, I hadn't put the the lens and the camera through the test here, but this was, you know, this was, listen, they wanted me to come at seven o'clock. I said, can I come earlier when these guys are still waking up so I can get these moments? Again, that's so important in photography access. So I talked them into coming early before the gates open. They let me in, you know, it took a lot of, a lot of hassle, a lot of polite hassle, uh, a lot of pushing. And, you know, these are the moments I was trying to capture. And I was nervous at first because I can't check the photo with my, <laughs> with my, Screens are like, did I capture this? This is a very rare moment, very hard for me to get. I mean, it's not, it happens every day, but hard to get access to. And I was, I was very impressed with the, with the range here. I was very impressed with the exposure and I didn't, you know, very little grain and the little grain it did have, I kind of liked that grain on it. So it, I was very impressed with the way this camera worked, worked in low light. 
Yeah, it is. I, I think this picture, uh, this picture uh, sh shows shows everything when it comes to. to yeah, it's so dark. I mean, this is pitch dark outside. This is I'm just using the ambient light from the bulb, and you know I'm just waiting for the elephant to get a lit by a little bit by that bulb because as you can see, there's a lot of shadows in the background. So, you know, luckily the moment came together at the right time. You can't predict these things, you know. <laughs> so you just sit and wait, and you trust your gear and. That was, I had trusted the camera for everything else up until that point, but I wasn't sure about low light. And this was very reassuring to me afterwards. And I thought, okay, now I can do more and I can go out, you know, really late. I have pictures following Rangers out when I went back again to Africa after this. And yeah, I'm very impressed with that, with the way it performed. There's uh, one question from uh, Tristan here who was asking, um, there are so many pictures on social media, millions and millions of pictures. Uh, how do you make your picture stand out from from the rest? Because you say you want to to catch the attention and you want to uh, increase the awareness of mm -hmm. this. So your your photos must be something different than from what you can uh, explore on social media. You you yeah, think they are outstanding in a way that it, that it catches the interest of the people. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm looking. There's a couple of things. Is I'm asking people to commit to a series of images, to a story. So in my project, I want them to love an individual image, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay with less of an audience. You know, I'm not looking for a hundred. Okay, it's great to have hundreds of thousands of followers, but I'd rather have a, you know, less people that really care and want to learn more. So I'm looking to capture intimate moments and I'm looking for commitment out of people. And again, it's hard in this day because everything's so instant, but I'm asking people to look at these as a series of images that tell a story. You know, I still believe in that art form of a photo story, of a photo essay. So I put a lot of thought into the way I sequence the images on my website, into the way I sequence the images even on social media. So for me, it's not always just about one image. That tends to be great for competitions. I'm not, of course, it's nice to win those, but that's not my focus. I'm, get, I, I'm asking for a bigger commitment. You know, for me, it's like I'm asking people to commit to a long form documentary. And that's what this is. You know, this project, each chapter is its own story and the whole project as itself is a really long form documentary so uh, you know I, i don't one image great i want each image just to be powerful each image to be powerful but i really i'm looking for a bigger commitment out of people and it's hard in this day and age but less people but care more and more passionate and more, take more action that's more important to me and the way i try to make a photo impactful is you know i it's by just being present and looking for interesting stories and looking for that connection And really just waiting, sitting and waiting for moments like this, that's important to me. You know, I want a moment like this. And that's what, you know, it takes a few days sometimes. Sometimes it takes a few weeks. And as a project, it can take several years. So it's just being patient, waiting and being and, and being present when these things happen. I mean, honestly, for me, it works, I, I think. <laughs> Thanks. So before we having a look at, at uh, your last series here today, um, Let's come back to that to that project topic that you mentioned. Um, you said you, this this is your personal project, and uh, mm. you really put all your effort and your heart in it. Um, do you think it's important for for photographer who wants to develop themselves to do these things? I mean, uh, some photographers they um, they've maybe never start to do such a project, and do you think this is necessary to? develop to to the next level or to develop your your approach to photography in general 100 one of the, the if i could give one piece of advice to any photographer out there is to give yourself a personal project no one's going to give it to you you have to find it and you have to shoot it and it's that project is where you can fail as a photographer it's where you can experiment it's where you find your style as a photographer it's where you grow my first project i did on uh was maybe I don't know, over 10 years ago, I did on Victims of Agent Orange and I spent time and I was focused on that project, but I made so much growth, so much more growth than I did in school because I was shooting every single day. I was trying different things. I was learning how to tell a narrative, how to tell a story. I was learning how to sequence my photos. I was experimenting with exposure, with composition, with all sorts of different things. And not just the beginning of your career. For me, I'm making growth now as a photographer. I don't want to be stale in my work. I don't want to be complacent. And I did take too long to do it. So I wouldn't wait a decade like I did to start your next project. But you should always be working on stuff. I do have the luxury of, you know, because I shoot commercial work to fund going to these exotic places. But you don't have to. I think it's quite accessible. Anybody could do a story uh, in your backyard. You could do a story about your family. It's just the idea of getting a story in your head, 
you have to care about it. I would recommend you have to be passionate about it because you'll get bored and you'll quit. But if you care about a project, you'll get into it. You'll grow. Again, you don't have to go to far off places like I'm doing. Find something that's accessible to you, something you're interested in. And yeah, you'll grow. I mean, the growth that I'm having and, and the, how I can be creative because I can't do that on an assignment. If someone's paying me to go on a shoot, I don't have time to try new things and experiment and fail. If someone's paying me to do commercial work, I can't say, well, I'm going to spend the afternoon seeing what this camera can do in low light or seeing how I want to you know, compose this image with a different exposure. No, there's no time for that. So this is the time where you can grow. You, but you do have to treat it a little bit like a job. You know, you're going to have your ups and downs. You have to be self-disciplined. That's important. I really love to teach that is that you have to treat it like work. You have to say, okay, every Tuesday I'm going to go shoot. And every, you know, whether you're in Singapore, wherever you are, find something you like and then make a time you're going to do it once a week, twice a week, whatever you can commit to. But that's how you're going to grow. And then also I'll add to that too is that in the end, in your portfolio, people say, well, okay, that guy spent two years on that project and that woman only spent a week. Well, people don't care about that. People care about what the project looks. So you have a big advantage if you did spend two years on a project. If you're looking to get hired later on, you're going to have more depth to that. A lot of editors don't just care about, you know, uh, how much time you spend. They don't care. They care that you invested the time. They show that you care and they're not, they're not comparing it in that way. They just think this is a great story. This one maybe lacks a little bit of depth or, 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 you know, consistency in it. So it's putting the time in. No one cares in the end, no one's gonna measure that way. They're gonna measure on what the final output is. So spend time on something you're passionate about. I can't preach that enough. I'll go on and on about personal projects, but it's so important to do as a photographer at any stage in your career. And you think it's, it's uh, super necessary to have the freedom for such projects. So for you, it would not yeah. be to do this project when you get hired for it, when somebody is telling you, you have to deliver your results in, in two weeks or whatever. So, This is something. Yeah, because I might have two days, you know, and, and here I can say, well, you know what? I want to spend eight days with the rhino. So I'm going to spend eight days and I'm going to get a, a deeper story. And then sometimes I can, I can say, well, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to leave the other lenses at home today. I'm going to shoot with just a 50 and see what that looks like and see how that pushes me. Or I'm going to try to focus on stepping back a little bit rather than getting close uh, and see if, you know, I could have a whole day where I'm going to say, I'm going to look at how this person interacts with her staff or, you know, how this person reacts in their environment, or I'm going to get close to stay. Like it gives me a lot of time to be creative, a lot of time to be free. Again, like you learn a lot from your mistakes in photography, but when you're getting paid, you can't really, there's no time for mistakes. But when you're doing it for yourself, you can learn from your mistakes. You can make mistakes. So how much days do you, do you spend with the pangolins then? Uh, so this is a story that I did a long time ago, actually. Originally, I went up there for CNN to do a story and I actually forgot this was the same place and pangolins have been in the news obviously with COVID-19 and the connections or thought to be connections with, with uh, you know, these sort of wet markets and pangolin consumption. So pangolins, there's a, there's a rescue center in just outside of Hanoi, about two hours outside the city. This place is fascinating. These pangolins are confiscated again, like the rhino trade, people use it for traditional medicinal purposes. Again, it doesn't do anything. There's no proven value. It's the same, it's carotene, so fingernails and hair thing. Um, but people cook them, they eat the, the scales. They're very interesting animals. Most people don't know what they are. So this is a rehabilitation center where the, if they, the police have confiscated them or law enforcement confiscated them, then they are checked, their health are checked, the health is checked, and then they're released back into the wild. So these caretakers, this man had worked there for such a long time. I forget that I had seen him almost like seven years before that. And yeah, they look after them. They operate on them if they need it. A lot of the pangolins are very temperamental. So they die in captivity often. There's a lot of veterinarians don't have uh, a lot of science on this. So they don't know why they die. They just are, are scared. They're freaked out and they die from, from stress. And so I decided to spend a couple of days up there. So they, they even die after they have been rescued because of... After they've been rescued, yeah. Yeah, they'll die in captivity because they, they were stressed about the journey, stressed from being taken from, from their habitat. Uh, and the numbers are dwindling. Pengolin is such a fascinating story and an important story to get out because the numbers are going through the roof because there's such high demand in places like Vietnam and China. So the, uh, pangolins in the wild, they're almost extinct in Vietnam. And then in places like Africa, they're going extinct very quickly. Maybe this is also something that uh, we as humans should think about dying from, from stress. So don't don't yeah. stress yourself too much. Uh, I've seen a, a documentary once where they went to a to a market and you, where you could actually buy these pangolins. So it was just beside the, the oranges and stuff like that where you can buy just just uh, 
yeah, this little ball over here. And it yeah. wasn't, so, um, well, well, I mean, this is why I, photos are important. You know, I think people can relate. I'm hoping to appeal to, there's an older generation that might be set in their ways that is going to still keep eating these animals and, and think that it doesn't have an effect. But I think one of the positives from happening now in the world with, with, with COVID-19, if there is anything positive to say, it is shedding light on the illegal wildlife trade, the horrors of it, uh, not just the effects that it can have because of what people do, but, it, you know, these are criminal these are criminal organizations that run these things. You know, these are people that are that are having people murder. These are people that are taking advantage of other people, and it's an awful industry. And so, you know, not, my whole project isn't related to that, but it's important to shed light on that. And it's important to get a younger generation of people to to actually think about this kind of stuff. And so, it's important for me to get these projects out, not just at a global level. Uh, you know, living in Vietnam, I try to get these stories out locally as well, and to talk about as much as I can too locally. We have one uh, final question here from from uh, David, um, who's asking uh, if you if you have any practical advice for uh, aspire, aspiring documentary photographers, especially with the current industry climate. So you think it's necessary to do it in in, in the way of self funding, or um, is it possible still today to get some sponsors to do that work? Mm. Listen, I know people, some people have success with self-funding. I'm not a fan of it. I don't think it's sustainable to keep asking your friends and people you know to, to pay for you to do stuff. So I have a hard time with that because it's, it, you might be able to ask people one time and they might help, but they're eventually going to get bored with paying for your, for your work. So I think it's important to, you know, if you just love photography, it doesn't have to be. But for me, everyone's path is going to be different. For me, it's I can fund these projects. I can fund these stories by doing commercial work. And I put as much heart and dedication is my commercial work as I do my documentary work. And I learn from both. You know, a lot of my commercial work actually extends over into my documentary work and vice versa. If you look at my commercial work, which we're not going into, but it just, it has that editorial and documentary style. So there is a way to sell that kind of work. There is a way to, to monetize it. So I would say from a pure documentary standpoint, you know, don't kid yourself. It's not going to be easy to make money off of it, but it's, You know, a lot of these projects, don't think of it that way. Think about it as you're investing in growth as you as a photographer, so you can le learn to do other things uh, in photography. So for me, I fund my projects my, myself, but I would say, you know, if you're waiting for someone to give you a project, you'll wait your whole life. You have to get out there and shoot. You have to start a project, and you have to treat that project like you would your commercial work, which means having a schedule with it, putting time into it, reviewing the work constantly, and treating it like a job. I mean, it's not, some photographers are drawn to the fun part, but it's not always easy. You'll have your ups and you'll have your, have your downs, but you have to power through the downs and just look at everything, even when you're not getting paid for something, which, you know, I agree. I always think people should get paid when they can, but your own project, just put the time in. You got to grind, you know? <laughs> Amazing project, honestly. Not only Thank this, you. every every project that, that we have seen so far. I appreciate that. This is a project that means the world to me. As you can see, I get passionate about it. Yes, it's like the way you talk about it. Uh, I, I think uh, everybody can see that you really put a lot of, lot of effort and and your heart to it. So nice, nice. And I think that. Thank you, and I, I think it's important to you know for me that's a, a long learning process for me. But it's you know you don't have to. Everyone thinks they have to find that story that's going to win these big awards, but you need to find a story that. Don't think about awards. Don't think about what's, okay, what's everyone want to see? How can I think about what you care about and the message that you want to put out there and the stories that you want to tell? And when you're interested, man, you'll, you'll never get bored doing your project. You'll keep hustling. You'll power through the lows and you'll, you'll keep shooting and you'll keep growing as a photographer. So for, for everybody who, who was listening today and uh, things like, oh my God, this pictures are so amazing. I need to, I need to run to the, to the next saw and get my M10D. Uh, so that <laughs> too. Uh, I mean, uh, as you know, currently our our stores um, are closed in Singapore, but um, we have a very special promotion today for our online store. So if you say like, I need to have the the M10D right now, um, please visit our online store uh, Leica minus store dot sg. And if you enter the promotion code Leica one hundred, um, then you will get a hundred dollars off from any purchase regarding. Uh, cameras or lenses so and if of course if you if you get the two of them you get two hundred dollars off and uh, so you can uh, immediately start your uh, your personal um, project that Dustin mentioned 
<laughs> so I know I know it took us a little bit longer today. Um, Sorry, <laughs> but I think uh, this is definitely no problem because I I I think not only for me it was super interesting uh, to listen to you. I um, I really hope it was uh, as interesting for for everybody. If if you don't have enough uh, of, of photo um, input today, uh, you can later on visit our. Um, store like a um, like a store Kuala Lumpur uh, visit us on Facebook or Instagram um, because we will have another session later on uh, the fundamentals of photography so uh, we yeah we we don't only look at at, uh, at the end result we talk about how to create a picture and this was uh, this will also be hosted by me so a little bit of a commercial in uh, yeah in this thing and um, yeah, Justin, uh, what, what else can I say? Uh, thank you very much for, for today's session. Uh, I really appreciate it. And um, I, that, that's why I, I don't mind about the time if we, if we take one hour, or one, <laughs> one hour 20 or even two hours, I think uh, we would be able to sit here for three hours and- uh, <laughs> No, we would be bored. <laughs> we'll find out to, um, thank, you, uh, thank you again for, for joining. And um, please let us know your, your feedback and uh, of course, if you like the session, also please let us know. Um, sure. And if they want to get in touch with you, uh, how can they? How can they do that via Instagram? Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you guys for letting me share this story and getting their, their, you know, these wonderful people getting their stories out. The more eyes on it, the better for me. So I'm excited. You can follow my. You can follow me on Instagram. I do a story probably a month for the project on uh, my handle is askmot a s k m o t t. And my website, if you want to subscribe, is just my full name.com, Justin Mott, M O T T.com. So you can follow me there, subscribe. I have uh, more pictures from these stories on there if you want to check it out. And if you have questions for me, I'm very open to answer questions about the Leica camera system or you know, just photography in general. You can ask me on Instagram, Facebook, wherever you'd like. So ask away. And if we didn't get to your questions today, I'm sorry. And thank you for listening to me talk for so long about something I'm passionate about. Is, is, there, is there anything they can do immediately if they, if they want to help? Like can they pay pay now you some some money or how, how does it don't work? pay me pay the organizations uh eat, eat on my website justamop.com there's a whole section for this project under kids and guardians and within each chapter there's a donate button that does not go to me it links you directly to each organization and i can tell you i wouldn't put their link up there if i didn't think they spent the money to do the right things they're all wonderful people they all need your help so if you can support you can go whatever story interests you or whatever animal interests you um, go to their website. They all could use help and funding because they're all doing wonderful things to to help this planet <laughs> and to help these animals. Okay. So then goodbye to everybody and uh, Dustin. Bye uh, guys. Thanks again for, for the session today and uh, I really hope we, we see each other when we will be back to business in our stores. So. Yes, back to normal. I hope to start more chapters of the project. Thank you guys. Thanks for your time. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. See you.